One night the sect leader of the Spirit Blade sect, named Lamoto, saw something on his sword. Based on his calculation, there were only three to five years of peace left, and then the age of Mapo would happen. An elder named Ubu heard this information, and she could not believe that the age of Mapo was coming. A few moments later, something fell from the sky, and at the same time, Ubu also felt something as if someone was held her face. It turned out that a time-traveled soul had been born in a distant village, and he was named Oraku. After twelve years, Oraku decided to enter the Spirit Blade sect as a disciple. A few days before the start of the Celestial Gathering, many of the participants wanted to live in the VIP room which was managed by Ray. Since there were hard-headed participants who wanted to enter the VIP room, the two test administrators came there to warn them. When the test administrators left, a participant named Kai asked Ray what were the requirements to get the VIP room. So Ray answered that they needed the special access ticket. But she added that this ticket was only for one person. Oraku suddenly came there with the special access ticket, so he was immediately led into the VIP room. In the evening, Kai thought of visiting Oraku in his room. He wanted to know how he got the special access ticket. But before Oraku told him this, he wanted to ask for something in return. He wanted Kai to be his assistant for one day. Kai agreed to this, so Oraku started to tell him the story how he acquired the ticket. He said that he got it from an old man who seemed to be looking for someone to talk to, but no one was paying attention to him. He approached this old man and gave him something to drink because he might be thirsty from the non-stop talking. Kai remembered that this was the same old man that he had given the water to. But according to Oraku, this old man liked the shopkeeper in the town. He did not have the courage to approach this woman, so he helped him confess his feelings to her. The old man was so happy that he gave him the ticket. Meanwhile, a sect elder made a bet with Ray if she could sell more than 100 pieces of radish in just one day. Ray was confident that she could do it, but it turned out that the sect leader had a condition, he told her that she should raise the price, so the next day, she had a hard time selling the radish. When Oraku and Kai went out the next day, Oraku's assistant, named Auchu, came to inform him that the bandits took their belongings. Since their supply of food was also taken, Oraku offered Ray his help in selling radishes in exchange for three days of food. Ray immediately agreed to this, so Auchu and Kai started selling them to the people. But because the radish was so expensive, the people hesitated to buy. A few moments later, Oraku came there and pretended that he would buy all the radishes. He told everyone that the Kinray radish had the ability to purify their spirit base. Because of its effect on the spirit base, the radish should cost 10,000 Rio. He added that people should not miss this opportunity because it was so cheap. For this reason, the people immediately rushed to buy them and their supply was sold out quickly. So at night, Ray prepared delicious food for them and brought the food for the next few days. She also gave him a small pouch containing a key and gold coins as a reward for his help. Three days later, they headed to the first test which was held at the Golden Bridge. According to the test administrators, their first test was to cross this bridge. Bunhao supporters moved quickly to cross it, but they were only electrocuted because only those under 12 years of age were allowed to cross it. Because of this, the participants who were over 12 years old decided to go home. Oraku and Auchu started to cross, and after a while, Kai joined them. While Bunho was worried that he was no longer with his companions, he noticed the pouch that fell from Auchu and he picked it up. After a while, the fog gradually thickened. So the rest of them decided to retreat, out of fear. When they were in the middle of the bridge, they saw a fountain. It was a mystery to them on what was the use of this test because they had to pay gold to get water from it. When Oraka touched it, he filled it with dirt and the other participants were surprised when it brought out gold. So Oraku immediately thought that this fountain was a converter of the five elements. Shushin thought that it might be part of the test to get water from there to bring to the other side. Because of this, they had a problem where to get gold, so Oraku pointed to the golden bridge. Everyone immediately took gold from the bridge, while the one they used was the gold-plated container that Ray gave. It was here that he realized that Ray might be related to the Spirit Blade sect because she somewhat knew that he could use the container. He did not know that the one who designed the test for this year had noticed him, and her name was Ubu. After a while, a participant thought of lifting the entire fountain, but the water just spilled out along with the converter, causing the bridge to suddenly disappear. 
The test administrators took a quick action to save those who fell, while others immediately held on to the rope. When Orica noticed this, they quickly ran to the other side and successfully crossed the bridge. They continued walking until they reached the Togan village. They poured the water they got from the fountain because it served as the key to the gate. When the gate was opened, they were happily welcomed by the citizens and prepared with delicious food. But for other participants, only vegetables were served to them. For this reason, the other three participants were very envious with Oraku because of the delicious food that was served to him. One of these participants introduced himself as one of the descendants of the Shah family and wanted to take Oraku's food. But Oraku just teased them which made them even more annoyed. Shu Shin approached and explained to everyone why the food served to Oraku was delicious compared to the other participants. This was because of the amount of water they brought to this village. Shu Shin wanted to get to know Oraku because he was the only participant that he did not have any information about. So Oraku asked for his name, and he introduced himself as the crown prince of Diamond Country. That was the moment when Oraku and Aucha found out that Kai was also a prince of the Untai Empire after Shu Shin informed them. At night, Oraku and Kai discussed the possible test for the next day. Oraku said that since they entered the village, this was the beginning of their trial. And they need to get out of there, so the next morning, Aucha looked all around the village, and Oraku was right in his suspicion that they could not find a way out. Shu Shin approached her, and the two of them discussed about Oraku's suspicions in their current situation. Then Shu Shin also reminded her that by the time she crossed the Golden Bridge, she was already in the same level as Oraku since she was a participant as well. Because of this, she could do what she wanted and leave Oraku as his boss. On the other hand, Oraku and Kai were also investigating throughout the village. And based on what they found out, they would need to gain the hearts of the people living there so they could get out. In addition, they would also need to work or help the citizens because this was the only way for them to have something to eat. The next day, Bun Ho asked for their help because he was reprimanded by the mayor's wife after she lost a fight with Aunt Ryu who took him in. Oraku was already expecting this, and their mission was to resolve the fight between Aunt Ryu and the mayor's wife. While the other participants were struggling to help the citizens, Kai was trying to solve the problem with the help of Oraku. After two days, Kai had solved the problem. Because of this, he was given a clearance to leave the village. But the night before his departure, he gave Oraku the pouch containing a lot of money. He said that Bun Ho saw it fell from Aochu and was surprised that a single servant could carry such a large amount of money. Kai suspected that she might not be faithful to Oraku anymore, and she was thinking of leaving him. The next day after Kai got out of the village, the other participants realized what they had to do to get out of there. While the others were busy on different missions, Oraku still had not took any action. Aucha spoke to him because she had been given clearance to leave the village. Aucha pretended that she did not want to leave him, but this was what she had been waiting for a long time to happen. Orica knew that Aucha wanted to leave him, so he let her go and returned to her the pouch that Kai handed to him. But like the other participants, he also had no idea that he had been planning something for a long time. As each day passes there are those who complete the mission while others still fail. Until one day, the others were surprised that Oraku became active. Apart from this, they are also surprised because even if there is no mission in a household, he still help. He exchanged things that others needed, and through this, he reconciled the 120 people of the village. Until one day, he talked to the 121st person of the village who maintained the order of the area. Oraku knew that he had a mission to give to the participants, and this was what he planned to accomplish. According to this person, Oraku had to give money, but it should be the money that was being used in this village. It was here that he remembered the contents of the pouch that Ray had given him. He first thought of giving the gold coin because he had a hunch that it was also from this village. But he changed his mind and chose to give the key. And his suspicion was right, and this was the reason why this man took him out of the village. This person talked to Ubu, and when he removed the mask, it turned out to be Ray. Ray had a hunch that Oraku already knew the truth that she was the one behind the mask. Meanwhile, Oraku reached the place where they could get their reward. And because he got a lot of points in the village, he was given nice items. Meanwhile, Kai was currently fighting a monster and Aochu also came there. It turned out that Shu Shin was also with them and they noticed that the monster grew even bigger. It was only a few moments before Oraku came, and they were surprised that he arrived so quickly. 
It turned out that one of the rewards he got was the cloud stepping shoes, so even the clan elders who saw this were surprised. When he saw the monster, he took out the mystic frost sword, causing the clan elders to be shocked as to how it was included in the rewards. Booba thought that Orica might have gotten a lot of points, so he gave him this item. But what she was wondering was on how Oriku was able to control these two powerful items. Oriku immediately attacked the monster and quickly defeated it. After that, the heavy snowfall earlier was suddenly replaced by a clear weather. But the Mystic Frost Sword was damaged, so Ubu immediately appeared to scold him. Apart from the fact that he broke the sword, he also broke the four grand barriers, and because of him, the participants were able to pass the test and this ruined her plans. He suspected that he was hiding something so he searched his clothes and got the golden stamp. He intended to cash the golden stamp, but suddenly someone took it, and when Ubu chased after it, it turned out to be Linmoto. He reprimanded Ubu because of what happened. Then he summoned the other sect elders for a meeting on what to do with those who passed. They knew that they could not handle the 15 new disciples. For this reason, they decided to conduct a new test. After the meeting, the participants were called into a room where the sect elders were waiting. Their disposition will be checked, and the three participants that the elders chose would be the new core disciples of the Spirit Blade sect. When they started, Shu Shin was the first on the line, he was followed by Ao Chu and the other participants. When it was Orica's turn, the sect elders were surprised by what they saw. They never thought they would see the legendary Raycon in Oriku. After an hour, Ruri informed them of the three participants chosen by the sect elders. First on the list was Shu Shin, and next being called was Bun Ho. For the third participant, many were hoping that it was Oriku, but they were all surprised when Aoju was called. When the others left, Ruri informed Kai and Oriku why they were not chosen by the sect elders. She explained to Kai that the property of his Raycon could not maximize in the Spirit Blade sect, so his time would only be wasted if he was accepted there. But she was sure that other clans would not reject him, and they would send a letter of recommendation to Manpa Sinmon. As for Oriku, he had a spirit quality that was a heaven spirit which was rare among all. This was similar to the legendary emperor named Qin Shi Huang, who at the time was recognized as the strongest in the world. But when the age of Mapo began, almost no one possessed it, so the process of how to cultivate its Kai was forgotten. Another problem was that they could not recommend any other clan that he could join for his cultivation. But according to Elder Kown, he could serve as the Spirit Blade sex good luck charm because he had the ancient legendary Raycon. Orica thought to just accept it, but according to Ubu, the sect would not get anything in return from him, and instead, he would just be added to those needed to be fed. He immediately got what she wanted to convey as if she was asking for compensation, so he took out the gold coin that Ray had given him. The elders were surprised how Orican acquired this gold coin, called Shun Guzan. Limoto learned from Ubu that Ray gave it to Oriku in return for his help in selling the radishes. So Limoto quickly pulled Ubu, and it was here that he found out that Aucha was not the one that Ray had recommended. That's why he wondered why Ray recommended the one in Sanpin Raycon. After they returned, they gave Oriku a privilege on a request, since it was the custom of the sect for those who acquired the Shun Guzan. Orica thought and asked them if he could become a successor disciple. But because the other clan elders were busy with their respective disciples, Lamoto chose Ubu to be Oriku's mentor. Ubu could not reject it anymore because she did not have any disciples to train. After they settled everything, Kai also said goodbye to Oriku because he would go to Manpa Sinmon. While the other participants who were not Chusun were taken by small sects. Oriku also went to where Ubu lived, and from that time on, it would also serve as his home. Oriku's first task was to take an aptitude test. A few minutes later and while Oriku was doing it, Ubu immediately noticed his talent. But she also expected this from someone possessing a celestial spirit base. In the past two years since Oriku came there, he had been running in the area every morning. After this, he would also soak in the medicine bath that Ubu had prepared for him. And for two years, he had been attending the cloud crossing halls with other disciples to study math, minor languages, history, and mechanisms of cultivation. After their class, he met Ray who brought food for him when he was on his way home. After he ate, Ray decided to teach him martial arts. Ray called it the dragon subduing palms technique, where a very strong force comes out from the palm of the person used this technique. After Ray showed it to him, Oriku immediately began to study it. 
After a few hours of imitating her, Oraku already felt the key in his body. Because of this, he successfully performed the dragon subduing palms technique. Ray told him that if he studied it twice a day, he would surely achieve the Shushin level in his cultivation. When he got home, Ubu was still not there, and he knew that she was drinking liquor again. But after a few hours, she was already next to him, so he immediately got up. Since it was already morning, he decided to practice the dragon subduing palms technique, and Ubu wondered who was teaching him the martial arts. When he mentioned that he had learned more from this person in just one day than he did in two years with Ubu, Ubu got angry and told him to present this person to her. She added that if she was defeated by this person, she would let Orika do whatever he wanted to do. Orika went to Rei to inform her of what Ubu had said. At first, Rei did not want to take it seriously, but Orika reminded her about the insulting words that Ubu allegedly said to her, she got angry and decided to see Ubu. When they arrived at the house, it was only here that Ubu found out that Rei was the one teaching Oraku. As soon as the fight started, Ubu released a strong aura that Oraku felt for the first time, this was the strength of someone who reached the Jean Dan stage. But Rei still did not even show any concern about it. Ubu attacked first, and it was when they started exchanging their attacks. Unfortunately, rocks fell over Obu, which caused her immediate defeat. Because of this, she had to obey whatever Oraku wanted. So Oraku asked her to be serious about teaching him. Bubu said that she already started the training with Oraku a long time ago and had been spending money on the medicine bath for him for two years. Ray realized that this was the reason why Oraku's body had improved, which was also the reason he learned the technique she taught yesterday faster than expected. Bubu explained that she wanted Oraku's body to be ready for the amorphic bones technique. Since she could now see the effect of the medicine bath, she decided to start training Oraku in the amorphic bones technique. But before they started the actual training, she explained first what this technique was. She added that among the nine regions, her amorphic technique was the only technique that would surely work on Orica's spirit base. Since the progress of his cultivation was like trial and error, this amorphic technique would serve as his main source of direction and momentum. That was the moment when Orica realized why Lamoto chose Ubu to be his mentor. When their training started, Oraku experienced the extreme pain that the technique was causing to his body. But after three days, he was able to complete the first stage of amorphic bones. He continued his training and his studies at the same time. Every morning, he was in the cloud crossing halls to study, and he would do his training in amorphic technique in the evening. A month later, he also reached the third stage of amorphic bones. He noticed that his progress had slowed down, but according to Ubu, it was just normal. But he was having a problem because the technique he learned from Ray got affected. Ray thought that it might have been overridden by the amorphic bones because this was what usually happened when a person learned a more powerful technique. Since the amorphic technique was stronger than martial arts, it was possible that this would happen. Oraku begged her to teach him another technique that would definitely not disappear even though he was in training with the amorphic technique. Since Ray was having fun in training him, she thought of teaching him a technique, called Entangling Steps. With this technique, he would be able to facilitate his ability in running and climbing. Oraku quickly learned the basics of this technique in just one day. So Ray advised him to keep practicing this technique. Apart from this, she also gave him a new training partner. The next day, he went to Aya and ordered food. It turned out that the new partner that Ray was talking about was a bear, and he needed to fed it before they start to do the training. On the other hand, Aucho went to beat some goblins. Then she fed them, so they would acknowledge her as their master. One night, when Oraku came home, he found Ubu who was serious in reading a book. Since he was close in reaching the eighth stage of amorphic bones, she told him that there was one item that she wanted him to get, and it was the sanguine berry. It was usually being used after the foundation stage, but he could also use it. It was located in the Azure Cloud Peak, but only those disciples with low levels could go to this location. Coincidentally, there was an Azure Cloud Peak trial that would happen the following week, so Oraku decided to join it. After he informed Gaku about it, he went to Ray to borrow a weapon that he could use once he arrived in Azure Cloud Peak. Ray picked a sword that could create a skill set, called the Cloud Sword. She also taught him about the Cloud Sword skills. A week later, the disciples who had joined the Azure Cloud Peak had gathered together. Aside from Gaku, Kaku was also there to guide them. 
They noticed the strange color of Aucha's uniform, so Aucha explained that it might be because it had been washed too much. But she did it on purpose to make her stand out because she was jealous of Orika's uniform. When Oriku came, they entered the Azure Cloud Peak. They had no idea that Aucha made the goblins go with her. When they reached the Azure Cloud Peak, the goblins quickly ran away to hide. They had to cross the Full Moon Valley to the Azure Dragon Gorge within three days. After several hours of running, Gakan noticed that the rest of them were panting. But he was surprised that Oriku was able to keep up with him. By noon, Gaka decided that they should rest and eat first. He told them that they could eat a lot of fruit in that place. When Bun Ho saw what looked like red berries, he immediately ate them, but those turned out to be a red bramble. Oraku quickly got some fruits that they could eat, and he shared it to his companions. Aochu took a lot of fruits, and Oraku was surprised that she could already eat so much. But the fruits she took were for the goblins. A few moments after they ate, they felt someone coming. Orika drew his sword to try to fight it. But it was just a Bujetsuku with a level of 1.4, so Orika just played with it. When Aucha saw the goblin's signal, she thought about what she was going to do. As soon as the others noticed the goblins, she immediately took action to make herself look like a hero. But she was surprised when a big monster suddenly appeared in front of her. Gaku quickly pushed her away and instructed Kaku to protect the other disciples while he would try to stop the monsters. But they were stopped when a tubo gestuga blocked them. Oraku approached and pissed it off, so it got angry and attacked. Kaku quickly created a barrier to protect them all because he knew that the creature was very strong. But he was surprised to see Oraku who was still standing in front of the monster as if he was not affected by its strength. After a few moments, Oraku started beating the creature while the others were dumbfounded. As Gaku was approached them, Oraku ordered the Tubo Jestuga to attack those who were chasing Gaku. After what happened, Oraku was amazed as the monsters could not do anything to him. Gaku decided to cancel the trial and call in elders. When Kaku was about to do this, Oraku stopped her because he was planning to send Ubu there. Ubu gave them things that they could use on their way to Chisuhu. While he and Oraku would be left behind to deal with the other monsters and investigate so that they would not be an obstacle in the next trials. Gaka believed her, but they had no idea that this was just Ubu's way to get medicinal plants in the area. After they gathered medicinal plants, Ubu sent a letter to the clan leader and apologized for what she had done, she also decided that she would leave and go far away to pay for her sin. Elder Ryukin was ashamed of Elder Shurchi because Azure Cloud Peak was entrusted to him. When they called Elder Shurchi, he said that what Ubu had done was not a problem. Ubu left to Oraku the books that he would need for the next step in his training of the amorphic bones technique. One day, while he was soaking in the medicine bath, he was visited by Gaku and the others. They wanted to thank him for what he did during the trial. When they left, he was surprised that Bunho was still there. Bunho begged Oraku to teach him the sword techniques. It was not a problem for him as long as Bunho could keep whatever he would teach him as a secret. While they were on training, he immediately saw what was missing in Bun Ho. Because of this, he made a way to make him use the Raiken his sword play. He insulted him and talked bad about Bun Ho father, so in his anger, he accidentally used the Dark Steel sword skill. Because of this, he was also happy that he was able to try what was called the Music in Costa. He read about it in the book left by Ubu, and knew that the attacks that he would receive from Bun Ho were perfect for it. Because of this, he just continued what he was doing to Bun Ho, and when they finished, Bun Ho had reached 20 Dark Steel Sword skill sets. He felt the effect on his body, and thought that this might be the proof that he had reached the 8th stage of Amorphic Bones. In the evening, he went to Rei to ask her for help in the Inner Observance. So with her help, he was able to do the Inner Observance, which was why he could also see the paths inside his body. A month later, his training with Bun Ho became intense due to Bun Ho's constant improvement. When he got home, Ray made him try the inner observance again, and this time, he could see the rising pillars and the rest of them were even flashing. According to Ray, these pillars were his bones and the flashing ones were the progress of his cultivation. One day, Orica thought of taking Bun Ho with him to Ray. But Ray's restaurant was closed that day, so they hung out in the VIP room. Orica told them of his plan to return to the Azure Cloud Peak once again as a challenge mode, and he wanted them to join him. 
At first, Ray was not interested in this, but when Orica mentioned about the divine grass and other medicinal materials that she could sell, she quickly changed her mind. Oriku immediately went to Spirit Lake Peak to ask an approval using the permission form. Since they did not have a Tier 6 companion at the gathering stage to serve as their leader, it was not approved. Fortunately, he had another plan ready, so he successfully got the seal on the permission form. As he looked at the permission form, he realized that he did not know Ray's last name yet. When the three of them were together, he asked Ray for her last name, but she still did not want to say it, and only she only wanted her name to be written on the permission form. Oriku did not ask her again, and they headed to the Azure Cloud Peak. Meanwhile, Lamoto and the other elders welcomed Elder Shurchi from his three-year journey to different places. When Elder Shurchi arrived, Elder Ryukin immediately returned the Azure Cloud Peak. Shurchi noticed that there seemed to be someone in the Azure Cloud Peak. Lamoto was surprised to see Ray with Oriku, so he immediately thought of what they could possibly do. The group saw the Carmine Berry, but it was being guarded by a snake. It suddenly attacked them, so Ray immediately pushed Oriku and Bunho. Even though Ray was hit by the snake, she quickly got up to kill it. Since Ray was not even affected by the snake's attack, Bunho said that the rumors could be true that she might be a daughter of the sect leader. So Ray admitted that she was indeed a daughter of the sect leader. A few moments later, Oriku received a summoning charm from the sect leader. He immediately returned to go to the Spirit Leak Peak. Other elders and Elder Shurchi were also there, and that was the first time that he met him. It turned out that Elder Shurchi was the reason why Oriku was summoned because he wanted to see him. Apart from being the well-known legacy disciple, he was also Ugu's disciple and was close to her. He gave him a cloud fusion pill that came from a faraway place. Then Shurchi went with him back to the Azure Cloud Peak. When he found out that they had taken some carmine berries, he also helped on how to cultivate them properly. In the evening, the two of them talked, and they discussed the status of Orica's cultivation in the amorphic bones technique. Using the inner observance, Shurchi also saw the golden pillars in his body. He saw the yellow fluids that was formed from the combination of key. He told Oriku that he needed to build real bones from these yellow fluids to also form the amorphic swords. Shurchi brought out an alchemy furnace that released a golden pill and said that it would help him. When Oriku used it, he immediately felt how strong its effect on his body. The next day, he found out from Aya that Ubu had returned, but she was currently in a conversation with Elder Ryukin and Elder Hakako because she was involved in another trouble from a different sect. When he arrived at the Spirit Lake Peak, he learned from Kay that the people from the Psycho sect were there and complaining about Ubu. They were currently in a meeting with Limoto and the other sect elders. After Ryukin asked Ubu, they found out what she had discovered. They just needed to show it to Limoto so that he could make a decision. When Ubu and Orika talked, she told him what happened to her. It was about a new sect, called the Thousand Spirit. They took advantage of using the slogan cultivation for all to make a lot of money. One day, she faced some disciples of this sect, and she beat them all. Then she also fought an elder whom he quickly defeated. But the elder of the Psycho sect, named Shinho, intervened. When Shinho saw the information given by Ubu, he immediately complained because Lamoto had favored Ubu. He could not accept that Lamoto believed in her. The elders were united to support Ubu that even Ryukin and Hakako who were not friends with her also believe in what she had said. Shinho warned them that the Spirit Blade sect might end up in a fight the Psycho sect, but Limoto just laughed at this because he knew that the Psycho sect would not gamble for someone like Shinho. Suddenly, Ubu came there to challenge Shinho in a fight to end it all. The loser of this battle must confess and should give his valuables to the winner. Shinho immediately agreed to this because he thought that Ubu was only at the Jean Dan stage, and his level was higher than her. When he took out his Kenzakin, which was known to have a huge value, Ubu was excited because it was worth a lot of money. Limoto brought them all to the battleground, and Shinho was surprised by what he did. They were in the Undoku Tendai, which was the largest arena of the Spirit Blade sect. After a few moments, the other disciples who were below noticed them. Oriku was also there to encourage other audience to bet on who would win in the battle. When the match started, Shinho used the Kenzakin to change the appearance of the stage. Then he followed it up with his attack, but it was easily blocked by Ubu. He attacked again which was also stopped by Ubu, and in his next attack, Ubu's weapon was damaged. 
but he was surprised that Ubu was able to create a new weapon so quickly. This made him wonder if she was really just in Jean Dan level. He tried using lightning, but it still did not work on her. Because of this, he rushed forward and they exchanged attacks. Until he poured out all his strength, but Ubu's power still prevailed. He knew in himself that he could not fight anymore, so he just accepted his defeat. For this reason, he gave the Kenzikin to Ubu and he left with his disciples. But on his way back, they met another elder of the Saikyo sect, named Duni. He insulted Shinho on his defeat, so in Shinho's anger he rushed at him, but Duni got ahead of him. He could not fight back anymore, so he was turned into a donkey. Duoni sent Shinho's two disciples back to the Saikyo sect, while he stayed behind to investigate. He called his two disciples to investigate and find the strongest cultivator of the Spirit Blade sect. Then he sent a letter to Limoto with a bag. When Limoto looked at it, he was surprised by its content. While Duoni's disciples were investigating, they saw Oraku. Based on what Oraku was wearing, they knew that he was a successor disciple, so they decided to follow him. When they reached the forest, Oraku suddenly disappeared, and they were attacked by the Bujetsuku. Then it was here that Oraku showed up to them, and he already knew that they were following him. Since Oraku knew that they were from the Saikyo sect, the two decided to fight against Oraku, but they were easily defeated. At night, they reported to Duoni, so Duoni decided to return to the Saikyo seat, and he ordered them to continue the investigation. One day, all the disciples were summoned for an important announcement. This was about the Spirit Blade sex plan on a new program to find disciples with proper abilities. They would conduct a test, and everyone who was at the Chikuki level must participate. Oraku decided to join it, and he informed Ubu about it. Because of this, Ubu decided to give him the Kenzikin. She also told him about the spirit inside the sword. As soon as Oraku touched it, he went inside it and saw the spirit that Ubu was talking about. Rianchu introduced herself, and Ubu also entered there to ask her what she thought of Oraku. According to her, she thought that he had a good experience. Oraku decided to accept the Kenzikin because he was confident that he could control this spirit. The day of the exam had arrived, and the participants gathered together. But for Oraku, the most important thing was not the exam, but getting back to his village. One of the tests given to them was to return to their respective places to mingle with ordinary people. When Oraku came to his place in Aji village, he immediately noticed that something was different in the area. Whenever he passed by some villagers, he would try to talk to them, but they just avoided him. When a child saw Oraku and recognized him, he ran to meet him, but the child tripped, so his mother immediately helped him. Because he got a wound, his mother anointed him with water. According to a child, the water came from an enlightened person named Shu who said that it could cure any disease. While he was walking in the market, he noticed that other people looked at him badly. After a while, he met the mayor of the village. He told him what he noticed in the village, so the mayor brought him to its house to talk about it. He learned the other information about Shu and the sect where he belonged to which called Chishi. Shu made the people of the village believe that the almighty hermit was with them. Apart from this, their other villagers had also joined this sect, and one of them was his childhood friend, named Kotora. They easily convinced the people because they brought the so-called divine water. Oracle had a hunch that the members of this sect might just be deceiving people. He asked the mayor how to get this divine water, so he found out that in order to acquire it, he had to pay first. This was also the problem of his father, named Ofuki, who was currently negotiating with Shu. Due to the large amount demanded by Shu in exchange for the sex service and divine water, Ofuki was having second thoughts about this. A few moments later, Orika suddenly came to the building where they gathered to oppose to the demands of Shu. They had an argument until Shu realized that he could not fool Oraku. Because of this, he decided to kill Oraku to show to everyone that this was a divine punishment, but he was surprised that Oraku was able to block it. Oraku decided to eliminate Shu, so he took out the Kenzikin. When he attacked, Kotora quickly blocked the way to stop him. He thought that Kotora would admit to everyone that Shu was just deceiving them, but he only defended Shu and the Chishi sect. For this reason, he got annoyed and decided to kill Kotora as well. But his father immediately stopped him and pulled him out from the building. Because of what he did, his fellow villagers became angry at him, and this made Shu happy. At night, while they were talking in their house, their other villagers went to confront them. 
Oraku immediately went out because he knew that he was their target. Together with the villagers, Shu and other members of the Chishi sect including Kotoro were also there. When his fellow villagers attacked him, he just aimed at the weapons that they were holding. Then Riancha told him that if he wanted to stop the evil act of Shu, it would be better if he would just kill them. One of Shu's companions tried to fight him, but Oraku quickly defeated him. Then he fought the other companion of his opponent. When the stable of horses was burned, one of the enemies released dark butterflies from its blood that killed the horses. He released more of these, but this time, Oraku just swallowed them all. After what they saw, the enemy could not do anything to stop him, so the villagers ran and so did Shu. The next day, he went at the place where the meteor fell, and he remembered that incident again. A few moments later, someone threw a stone at him with a note saying that he was a demon. His father came out, then he read the writings of their fellow villagers on the wall of their house. His father also knew that part of Orica's test was to go back to his hometown, so he thought that maybe this was his mission, to help his villagers in order to restore their sanity. After hearing this, he decided to fight against the Chishi sect to stop the fraud that they were doing. He went to Ray, but she just laughed at him after hearing what happened to him in their village. Bunho also appeared to them, so Ray wondered why both of them came. Bun Ho said that the requirements in the recommendation letter were too dangerous for him, so he was looking for a partner. Since Oriku also needed help, he and Bun Ho decided to work together. But when Bun Ho found out that it was a Kyoten that they were going to fight with, he had second thoughts. It was here that Oriku said that they would ask Ray for help, but Ray immediately refused. Oriku told Bun Ho to go out first, after that, he kneeled and begged Ray, and with his insistence he was able to convince her. So at night, they went to Kotora to kidnap him. Oraku asked him about the location of the base of the Chishi sect, but it turned out that he did not know about it because he had never been there. The only one who knew about it was Shu, but he was currently hiding. Kotora said that there was a group that observed the village from the mountain, and there was a high possibility that they knew the location of the sect's base. Oraku used his ability to find them, and after a few seconds, he immediately tracked them down. He went to the location, and when he returned, he was already carrying one of them. Orica threatened to throw him off the cliff, so he was forced to speak about the location of the base. The next morning, they immediately went to where it was. When they arrived there, Oraku asked Bun Ho to pretend to be a traveler disciple who was asking for help, so he could get inside and meet the leader. Bun Ho was immediately let inside, and he did not expect that it would be this easy to get in there. When he met the leader, named Cain, he saw him being surrounded by women. So when he came out OD the room, he was still dizzy because of what he saw inside. Based on his observation of Cain, he had a hunch that he was a level 9 Chikoki. Oraku asked him what else he noticed inside, so he also mentioned about the women. When he mentioned a woman named Muhika, whom Cain was holding, Oraku suspected that she was a level 4 Chikoki who might be Cain's helper in strengthening his power. Oraku planned to save the other girls who were in that room first. And in order for them to do this, he thought of sending Rei to pretend as a servant. In Oraku's insistence, Rei could not refuse, so she agreed to the plan. By afternoon, Rei prepared and started their plan. When she went there, she was immediately accepted because of her beauty. She was asked to clean her body first. After a few minutes, she was dressed in new clothes and was brought to Cain. When she was about to approach him, he told her to crawl, so she followed the command. But when she stood up in front of him, Cain was disappointed because she was almost flat-chested. Because of this, Cain kicked her out, and when Ray went to Oraku, she was furious after the insult that she received from Cain. The next day Oraku thought of a way, and he wanted to disguise as a girl. At first, Ray and Bunho did not recognize him, but when he turned to face them, the two were surprised to see Oraku's appearance. It turned out that he used the amorphic bones to enlarge his chest. By afternoon, she pretended to be drunk for a reason that her boyfriend cheated on her. When the caretaker saw her, Oraku was immediately let in and was taken to Kane's room. Kane was about to kiss Oraku, he moved quickly and that was when they started to fight. Muhika heard a noise and was about to enter to see what was happening inside, so Ray also acted to fight her. In Ray's desire to get revenge from the insult of being flat-chested, she beat Kane and Oraku. They brought the two enemies to their hideout, and Kane was surprised to see Oraku as a man. He immediately recognized him as the disciple who returned to Aji village. 
When he learned that Oraku was the legacy disciple of the Spirit Blade sect, he immediately announced that he would surrender. Apart from this, he also knew that the Spirit Blade sect was one of the five strongest sects of the 10,000 Enlightened Alliance. The legacy disciple was recognized as a super elite disciple and was the inheritor of the Elder's Secret. Orica thought of taking the two to their village and asked them to apologize and admit to the people that their sect was just fooling the villagers. But according to Kane, even if they do this, the people of Aji village would not be able to change their minds. They would only think that Oraku forced them to do what he wanted. That was the moment when Kane told them why they did those things. He said that the elders of the Chishi sect were also faithful at first. Until some of them realized that no matter what they do to practice, they could not see any development within them, so others just focus on accumulating money. From what he said, Orica thought of something to counter this kind of practice by the villagers. He thought that one of the reasons why many were deceived was because of their desire for enlightenment. This was a heavenly mandate that people could not refuse, so when he told his villagers to stop following this mandate, it only created chaos. He wanted to get rid of this mandate, so he thought of building his own sect. This sect's mission was to collect intelligence tax from these kinds of people. But they would also use whatever they collect for the good of these people. Ray did not want to join this mission, but according to Oraku, they needed a lady strategist whom people would love since she possessed beauty. After hearing this, she volunteered to fill this position. Since they need members, they had also taken Kane and Muhika. Then they decided to name the sect as Chikyu. Meanwhile, in Aji village, the villagers became even more angry at Oraku. They planned to capture Oraku and offer him to one they believed as hermits. Suddenly, someone came there to show them what was happening outside. It turned out to be Kane and Muhika whom Oraku has assigned to start their plan. Kane told those who came to them that he felt a demon in the village. And they were there to exterminate this demon. The villagers thought that Oraku was the demon that Kane was referring to because he killed some members of the Chishi sect. But they were surprised when Mohika said that this Chishi sect was the one that brought evil to the village. Kane used his blood purification signal to supposedly remove the evil aura from them. They had no idea that Kane just brought their blood pressure in a low level. Muhika clarified that the Chishi sect was the reason why the village was surrounded by a bad aura and the people were just deceived. In order to eradicate the bad aura completely, Kane told them that they wanted to tour the entire village. Some villagers guided them inside, and when they arrived at the vacant lot, Kane said that he could feel the bad aura of those who were buried in the area. He warned the people that this would not be taken care of, it would spread throughout the village and would harm them. They immediately started the purification, but the whole area became dark and the supposed souls of those buried there suddenly came out. They fought these dark souls until Ray appeared to them and pretended to be the leader of Cain and Muhika. Using Ray's power, she easily consumed the opponents. Then Oraku also appeared whom they called as the founder. When Cain asked Oraku what he was doing there, Oraku said that he intended to build a Hudan in this village. He instructed Kane to prepare for it, and then he suddenly disappeared. The people of Aji village were amazed at this, and since they had no idea about Hudan, Kane asked the mayor for a place so he could explain it to them. When they left, that was when Ray removed from Oraku the cloth that made him disappear. Then they also told Bunho to come out since he was the one who created the enemies that Ray fought earlier. Kane told the people of Aji village that the Hudan would gather the Raiki in the village and turn it into magical stones. For this reason, there was a great possibility that the village would also become rich because of these magical stones. But in the construction of the Hudan, there were also things that they should consider. The villagers said that they were ready to help as long as the construction of the Hudan would continue. On the other hand, Ray thought that Oraku was just starting to learn how to build a Hudan, but she was surprised that Oraku had studied it for a long time. The next morning, Oraku instructed Kane and Muhika to buy the materials that they would use. After they finished buying those materials, Ray and Bunho helped them so they could take them to Aji village. With the help of the people, they immediately started making foundation bricks for the Hudan. Meanwhile, Oraku was also busy identifying the path of Raiki. When he completed it, he let Ray be in charge on this. The mayor did not expect that his house would be an obstacle on Raiki's path, so Ray wanted to remove it. In the following days, they all became occupied in doing the tasks to build the Hudan. Until the day came when the mayor's house had to be demolished. 
but the mayor still begged the people not to destroy his house. But the villagers did not listen to him, fortunately, Ofuki came there to stop them. He was able to stop the demolition until the day came for Oraku to start building the Hudan. Although the mayor's house would surely be an obstacle, Oraku still decided to continue building the Hudan. He told them to move back, then he started the ritual. As Rei was watching Oraku, she remembered the Hudan created by Elder Rick Yuri. But Elder Rick Yuri did it when he was at the level of Kyoten. So if it would be compared to Oraku's current level, there was a big difference. However, she had confidence in Oraku's ability that he would be able to do it. A few moments later, a tornado appeared where Oraku was standing. Oraku was complacent that he would succeed in this until he realized the effect of the mayor's house in the ritual. It was here that the Raiki gradually reacted violently, and this made it difficult for him to control it, but suddenly, he felt something move. It turned out to be the part of the meteorite that fell near their house. It was able to stop the uncontrolled power of Raiki, so Oraku was able to successfully create a Hudan. When Oraku approached the Hudan, he felt that the meteor shard was inside it. He named this Hudan as a Million Chaos Ball. A few minutes later, it released high-quality magical stones from just absorbing a little bit of Raiki. Kane's best friend and also an elder of the Chishi sect, named Shachi, found out what Kane did. After he informed their leader, named Shojin and other elders, Shachi was assigned to go to Kane to confirm if he had completely betrayed the Chishi sect. He took Kotora with him to the Aji village since he was a resident there. Oraku started charging intelligence tax and used it for the betterment of the village. When Rei asked what they were going to do next that they already had funds and people to do the work, Oraku said that they should prepare because someone would come soon. Rei found out that he had sent a complaint to the Human Effort Temple about the Chishi sect. Since he was a legacy disciple and also a member of the Spirit Blade sect, the Human Effort Temple could not just ignore it. When Shachi arrived at Aji Village, he ordered Kotora to deliver a letter to Cain. In the evening, it was delivered immediately to Cain, and Muhika talked to him about it. Cain decided to see Shachi, but Muhika was worried that he might just lose. The next day, he met with Shachi, and he was asked if he had betrayed the Chishi sect. He did not give other answer other than whatever was there had already happened. In Shachi's anger, he attacked Cain, and this was when their fight started. Shachi did not want to use his technique because he wanted to defeat Cain with just his fist. They continued to exchange their attacks until they reached the river. It was here that Shachi had a chance to overthrow Cain. Then he grabbed Cain, and when he was about to blind him, someone suddenly attacked him which was done by Rei, and this caused Shachi to immediately lose consciousness. They worked together to lift him and take him to their base. However, Kotora was not far away and left immediately after witnessing the fight. When Shachi woke up, they forced him to swallow a written stone that was made from a million chaos balls. They said that it was a poison pill, but it was just a lie in order to make him join the Chikyu sect. After Kotora found out about it, he immediately went to Chishi sect to inform Shojin. A few days later, Shojin decided to attack the Chikyu sect. He told other elders to prepare their skilled disciples, and he himself would be the one to lead their attack. The elders immediately followed it, so most of the disciples started to act. One day, Muhika had a conversation with three travelers who were also enlightened. According to them, they wanted to join the Chikyu sect as well. Muhika and Kane were very happy about it and immediately toured them around the whole village. While Oraku and Rei were talking, he mentioned about the Soul Cultivation Ryu sect. Oraku found out that the leader of the Chishi sect was from this sect. Apart from this, he also read something that the members use the moon or stars to get stronger. So in case they fight the leader of the Chishi sect, they just have to make sure that he could not see the moon or the stars. Rei noticed that the villagers were always working hard, and their training progressed quickly. Oraku said that it might be because of the essence and the blood boiling technique which surprised Rei. This technique had long been forbidden for the reason that when a cultivator reached the limit of his training, he could surpass it using this technique. It was like a shortcut in training, but it had the effect of shortening the lifespan of its user. Orica made it clear that he did not use it as a shortcut, but it was really the only way for people who did not have Senan. He added that if they only undergo natural training, it would definitely take them a hundred years to reach the level of Chikuki. Apart from this, they also need to speed up the training of their colleagues so that their sect would become stronger immediately. 
While Shachi was teaching the children, he heard Mohika called Oraku. She told Oraku about the three travelers who wanted to join them. One of them mentioned that there were people from the Chishi sect gathering in the eastern part of the village. Because of this, Oraku immediately thought that they would soon be attacked by the Chishi sect. That night, Shojin decided to go to an abandoned house. After a while, Shachi came there who was the one he was expecting. Shachi advised him to back off because the founder of the Chikyu sect was not someone that he should underestimate. Aside from this, their founder was a disciple of the Spirit Blade sect, and this might cause greater problem to the Chishi sect if the Spirit Blade sect intervened. He told Shachi that he could not just back down until he talked to the founder of the Chikyu sect. But Shachi had no intention of helping him with what he wanted to happen, because it might end up to what he usually do of not communicating properly and leaving the meeting quickly. When Shachi left, Shojin suddenly felt that there were other people around him. He tried to find out its exact location, then he quickly went out. That was a moment when Oraku appeared to him, but it was just an astral projection. Oraku offered him to join the Chikyu sect, but he just laughed at it. Oraku was proud of the rapid progress of the Chikyu sect, but Shojin knew that they were using essence and blood-boiling technique on their disciples. Yet he wanted to reconcile with Oraku and forget what each sect had done to each other. But Oraku knew that if he just let Shojin get out of there, he would surely send a letter of indictment to the Human Effort Temple just like what he did. Shojin came out to try to use one of his techniques, but Rei stopped him and Oraku exposed himself as well. When Rei left, the other members of the Chikyu sect started attacking Shojin. But because of Shojin's strength, he was able to easily eliminate the members of the Chikyu sect. Just moments later, he used one of his strongest attacks which caused the death of his other attacker. He was unaware that his colleagues were attacked by Rei. When he heard Orika's voice, he was about to try his technique again, but to his surprise, it did not work. When he looked at the sky, he could not see any stars. It turned out to be covered with thick smoke from the fire created by the Chikyu sect. Orika reappeared and reminded Shojin that he could not defeat him because he already knew everything about the techniques that he was using. Then he also heard the cry from the ongoing battle in their base. When someone was about to attack Bonho, one of the three travelers who wanted to join the Chikyu sect came to save him. Then he also defeated another enemy that was approaching them. After removing the cover from his head, Bun Ho immediately recognized him because it turned out to be Kai. Sho Jin was about to try to go to their base, but Oraku immediately stopped him. Sho Jin could not believe that Oraku could use Chimia Kuhantan technique. But he also immediately thought that what he was seeing was just an illusion, because even a Jean Dan had difficulty in doing this technique. To get rid of this illusion, he just needed to defeat Oraku. He took out his sword and used the shooting blade, then he also followed it up with the clone blade. Oraku was able to avoid it, but when Shojin used the thrusting blade, Oraku was hit by it. He followed it with a tornado blade, and Oraku was also swallowed by it. But when he approached Oraku, he was surprised that it was Kane. A few moments later, the real Oraku appeared to him and applauded his strength. They both fought, but Shojin changed the form of his weapon. He relentlessly attacked Oraku until he crushed him. But when he attacked again, Oraku was able to stop it with Kenzuken. He noticed that Oraku was absorbing Raiki to strengthen himself, so he thought that he needed to take the fight seriously. He took out his sword again, and when he was about to attack, someone suddenly attacked him which was from Kai. Because of this, he decided to fight Kai first. Kai tried to attack repeatedly, but he could not hit Shojin. Until Shojin had a chance to attack him. Since Kai could no longer stand, Oraku and Shojin continued their fight. They exchanged attacks with their swords while they also discussed the effect of the essence and blood boiling technique. Shojin thought that Oraku's followers did not know the effect of this, but Oraku made it clear that all his followers knew what they were doing. A few moments later, Oraku fell into the big hole, and when Shojin was about to attack him, Rei suddenly came there to attack Shojin. Due to the strength of Rei's attack, he immediately lost consciousness. When the sun came up, Oraku approached Shojin who had just woken up. They talked again about the essence and blood boiling technique, so Oraku called one of his followers to ask why he wanted to be trained. He replied that it was for enlightenment and the welfare of the world, and Shojin was surprised to hear this. Oraku offered him again to join the Chikyu sect, and this time, he accepted it. 
When Oraku and Kai talked, Kai told the reason why he came there. He was curious when he heard rumors of a new sect fighting against the Chishi sect. Because of the rapid progress of the new sect, he became interested in it until he found out that Oraku was the founder of the sect. Although he was familiar about Oraku's behavior, he still did not quite understand what Oraku wanted to do. Oraku informed him that it was fine if he stayed with him longer to continue his observation which he also wanted him to do. A month later, the Chishi sect formally joined the Chikyu sect. Using the two Hudans, the Chikyu sect grew even faster, but they could not avoid getting into trouble with other sections Oraku would send Shojin and Shachi to negotiate with them, but if they could not arrive at an agreement, they would just decide to eliminate the members of the other sect. Half a year passed after the establishment of the Chikyu sect, and it immediately reached a hundred thousand members. Until one day, Oraku assigned Bunho to bring a letter of negotiation to the Diamond Empire. Bunho knew how difficult this mission was, but he could not do anything but follow Oraku. While they watched Bunho leave, Rei was worried that the 10,000 Enlightened Alliance won't accept Oraku's use of essence and blood-boiling technique, and she was sure that this was the same in the Diamond Empire. Even Kai asked Oraku if Bunho could do this mission. Oraku was confident and said that it would not be a problem because he sent an awoken Bunho. Meanwhile, Shu Shin was also currently in Diamond Empire without Chu to help his father. One day, he helped a woman escape from the Blood Cloud sect. He found out that her parents sold her because of fear on this sect. So this girl begged them to save her parents because the sect might do something bad to them. Because of this, Shu Shin decided to go to the place pointed out by the woman where her parents live. When they got to this place, they started to investigate the Blood Cloud sect. But it turned out that someone was also watching them, so after they ate, a group of men approached them because their boss, named Ken Ray, wanted to talk to them. When they came face to face with Ken Ray, he forbade them to do what they were planning. He informed them that he was assigned to lead the area, and regarding the Blood Cloud sect, he already talked to the Kumiyufu. But Shu Shin did not want to just wait for Kumiyufu, so Ken Ray also mentioned about the Twelve Wicked of the Blood Clouds. According to Aochu, they were those at the level of Chikuki or Kyoten. The Kumiyufu's solution on this was to send strong enlightened ones. But Shu Shin did not want to go back just like that because others might say that he could not keep his words. A few moments later, while they were getting ready to sleep, one of Kenrei's staffs visited them. He gave a map pointing the location of the Blood Cloud sex hideout. So the next day, they took action and immediately went to it. Shu Shin assigned his men to watch the entire area, while he and Aochu searched for the house where the parents of the girl was located. When they saw the house, they quickly approached it, but the dead bodies of the girl's parents appeared before them. Shu Shin immediately confronted the other people who were there until Ken Rei came as well. It was here that Shu Shin found out that Ken Rei was just letting the Blood Cloud sect do their activities to the area. In his anger, he could not stop himself from introducing himself as the crown prince of the Diamond Empire, and he said that he would make sure that Ken Rei would be held accountable to this. But Ken Rei just applauded his speech because he did not care even though Shu Shin was a prince. It turned out that he was with one of the twelve wicked of the Blood Cloud, and this person got closer to Shu Shin. He suddenly punched Shu Shin which he could not avoid because of its speed. Then it was followed by a series of attacks, and when Aochu was about to help, this man also attacked him. They were taken to the very hideout of the Blood Cloud sect, and were surprised to see many corpses in the dungeon. After a while, they heard a woman's voice that was familiar to them. A few hours later, they were presented to the leaders of the Blood Cloud sect. They intend to make them slaves, so they tested Shu Shin if he would fit as a slave. But Shu Shin refused to follow what they wanted him to do, so they tested Aochu too. In Aochu's fear, he just followed them, so they released him. But he was given an axe and they ordered him to kill Shu Shin. When he accepted the axe, Shu Shin kept begging him not to kill him. Because he could not do it, he tried to attack the enemy, but it turned out that he was ready for him. When he faced Shu Shin again, that was when Shu Shin begged them to make him a slave. Suddenly, they heard a woman who's making a noise, and she attacked the members of the Blood Cloud sect. This girl turned out to be Ruri, and when the other members of the Blood Cloud sect rushed at her, she easily defeated them all. Even the leaders could not do anything against her. Because of this, she saved Shu Shin and Aochu from the hands of the Blood Cloud sect. When they got home, Shu Shin found out about the Chikyu sect that wanted to negotiate with the Diamond Empire. 
So he immediately went to Kumiyufu to talk to Rinana, and he asked her to investigate the Chikyu sect including the Blood Cloud sect. But since Rinana still needed time, he could do nothing but wait. When he came out, he and K met because she was assigned to go to Kumiyufu to investigate as well. When he found out that she had been waiting for an answer from Kumiyufu for 10 days, he could not believe it, so he took her back to Kumiyufu. While they were inside the Kumiyufu, K was told by one of the locals that someone wanted to talk to her. It turned out to be Bunho, so he and Shushin also met. They waited in a room, and a few minutes later, Rinana went to them. She showed Shushin a list of documents which he needed to check. But there were about 2,000 documents in the warehouse because the documents of the entire empire were all processed there. This was the effect of the imperial court's order that Kumiyufu was not allowed to have other branches. There were so much things that they need to do, and this was the reason why there were many delays in their investigation. After hearing this, Shushin understood the situation of Kumiyufu. Since the letter that Kei brought was also about the Chikyu sect, Rinana had good news for them and Shushin, because Kumiyufu also received a letter from the founder of the Chikyu sect. She revealed that the one who brought this letter was the head of the diplomacy department, who was Bunho, this surprised both Kei and Shushin. They could believe that Bunho was a member of the Chikyu sect, and Kei was worried about it. So Bunho told the reason why he joined Chikyu sect, and it was because he loved Kei. But he also knew that he was not yet suitable for her, so he had to persevere to reach his goal first. Shushin could not understand why he joined Chikyu when he could come to join in their sect. So he said that if they had enough training in the Spirit Blade sect, why were they still sent outside? But everything he would do was also for the people he loved. So what he was was doing was not only for Kei, but also for Rinana because he loved her too. Rinana did not believe him because they just met that day. So he told her that he knew everything about Rinana. He knew the family she came from and how she got to Kumiyufu. Bunho also knew about Rinana's problem with Kumiyufu and wanted to help her. This was about Kumiyufu's desire to have a branch for a long time, and they just need approval from Kumiyufu. Although Shushin was against the Chikyu sex offer, he still could not stop Kei and Rinana from thinking about the sex offer. When he and Aochu talked about what Bun Ho and the Chikyu sect offered, Aochu had a suspicion that it was possible that Oraku was the one behind it. It was possible that Oraku was able to control Bun Hao's body using the authority Jules control. Because of this, Xu Xin immediately thought of the possibility that Oraku was also connected to the Chikyu sect. One night, Xu Xin's assistant handed him something which was from a self-identified member of the Chikyu sect. He went to the place mentioned in the letter because he had a hunch that it was from Oraku. But when he saw Oraku, Kei was also with him. He also boarded the boat, and here they talked about the Chikyu sect. He told Oraku that he intended to inform the Spirit Blade sect about the Chikyu sect. He also knew that the sect was using the essence and blood boiling technique. He offered Kei to go with him to complain about Oraku, but she declined his order. K believed that they should not judge a sect without seeing what it could do for themselves. Xu Xin could not accept that K was siding with the Chikyu sect. Because of this, he decided to send a letter to Elder Ryukin. Bun Ho and Rinana talked again about the Chikyu sect's offer. While Rinana was asking Bun Ho about the information that she still wanted to know about the Chikyu sect, Bun Ho remembered what Oraku had taught him. Rinana asked him many questions including Chikyu's method of using the essence and blood boiling technique, fortunately, he answered them all well. Since they understood each other well, they went to what they would receive from each other if their cooperation continued. Bunho told her all the Kumiyufu would receive, while the Chikyu sex request was for the official acceptance by the Diamond Empire. Their meeting continued for several times until the agreement between the two sides became official. Because of this, there was a party held in the Chikyu sect after Bun Hao's successful negotiation. While Bun Ho was having fun with Rei, he suddenly heard the voice of Elder Hakako who wanted to summon him. He looked at Oraku for a few seconds, and then he headed to the Spirit Blade sect. The next morning, Oraku also heard Elder Hakako's voice who summoned him as well. Bun Ho and Kei were currently facing Elder Hakako, Elder Ryukin, and Ubu in the room. While they were waiting for Oraku, they were also talking about the Chikyu sect. For Ubu, they should praise Oraku on what he had accomplished. When Oraku came there, he did not expect Bun Ho and Kei to be there too. He pretended not to know why he was summoned, so Elder Hakako threw him the letter which was from Shu Shin. 
but he said that he did not remember any prohibition to start his own sect while they were in the middle of the test. Elder Ryukin said that although the test was for them to have an experience while interacting with ordinary people, it did not mean that they could collect money from them. But Oriku said that since the day he built the Chikyu sect, he had not received any money from his followers. Apart from this, he also did not neglect his training, so he showed them that he was currently a level 6 Renki. But Ryukin and Hakako did not believe him yet, so he asked them to use the question sword on him. Since Bunho did not know about it, Kei explained it to him. She said that it was a method of each sect in cases where it was difficult to reason the innocence of a disciple. The spirit of a master was placed in this sword to ask the disciple's heart. If the disciple accepted it without any problem, it means that he was innocent. But if the disciple had doubts about himself, this would surely be his end. The elders agreed to this, but Oriku asked for three days before they executed. He said that he just needed to prepare something in Aji village because he wanted them to do it there. When Oriku came home, he told Shojin to build ten pillars in just three days. Although it was difficult to do, Oriku was complacent that they could finish it on time because they had many members who would help. They immediately started this and successfully completed it within three days. When Elder Ryukin and Hakako arrived, Oriku gave his report to Shojin. He wanted Shojin to give it to the leader of the Spirit Blade sect in case something bad happened to him. After that, Elder Ryukin started the question sword on Oriku. He immediately attacked with Shizui Reiku, but it did not work on Ryukin. Since Bunho did not know that Oriku could attack, Kai said that it was just like a normal battle. If Oriku could defeat Ryukin with his attacks, the question sword could be stopped, but according to Kei, this had never happened before. Oriku then used the Sega Tenkai, so Shojin remembered what Oriku had told him. With the help of the Ten Pillars, this technique became even stronger. Ryukin was impressed by this, but he was able to stop it easily. Then he started the question sword, and Oriku entered a black orb. Oriku knew that he was inside an illusion created by the question sword. At first, he heard voices blaming him for the deaths of several people. He knew that these were the ones who died after trying to fight against the Chikyu sect. After a while, he heard the voices of the fallen members of the Chikyu sect who were blaming him for their deaths in the battle. But he still did not let it affect him until he was drowned in blood and landed in the area with many skulls. When he got up, some souls of these people came out of the skulls who wanted to get their lives back. These were the ones who died due to the use of the essence and blood boiling technique. But Oriku had not yet felt guilty about it because he did not force these people, and they decided for themselves. While they all watched Oriku from outside, Ryukin decided to use the Dashin. Through this, the sword would dive even deeper into Oriku's heart. Oriku suddenly fell into a place where he saw the grief of his followers after the death of their loved ones. He also saw the last moments of others who died due to the use of the essence and blood boiling technique. There were others who had tried how strong they were, but this caused the end of their lives. Because of what Oriku saw, he was asking himself what was the reason why he founded the Chikyu sect. Based on the reaction of the Black Orb, Ryukin knew that Oriku was being affected by his conscience. Since Rei could not bear to see Oriku's suffering, she was about to go to Ryukin to stop it, but Shachi stopped her. Shachi told her that their leader would not like what she would do. After a while, Oriku used the Kinkatsu to gather the Reiki around them using the Ten Pillars. By this, he was able to strengthen his heart. But soon the pillars fell one by one, so Ryukin and Hakako immediately thought that Oriku intended to sacrifice his life to prove to everyone that what he did was right. For this reason, Ryukin decided to stop the question sword. Oriku's followers immediately approached him, but after a while, he also lost consciousness. The next day, the members of the Chikyu sect went to the house where Oriku was taken. Ryukin said that Oriku passed the question sword, but he still broke a law. Oriku suddenly woke up and asked them what was then law they were talking about. Hakako said that he violated the Mansonmai law. They wanted him to disband the Chikyu sect, and he must also return to the Spirit Blade sect to face the punishment. But they had no idea that Oriku had already prepared for it. He let Mohika come in the room who was carrying what he had ordered. It turned out to be the Mansonmai's approval on Chikyu sect as an official member of the Mansonmai. Because of this, Elder Ryukin and Hakako could do nothing but treat Oriku as innocent. 
A few days later, Oriku also decided to leave Chikyu to Shajin's care because he was going back to the Spirit Blade sect. He had also created plans for the Chikyu sect for five years. Because of this, Kai also decided to return to their sect. After Kai left, Oriku told Ray that he would pass by their house before heading to the Spirit Blade sect. Up to that moment, his parents still did not know that he was the leader of the Chikyu sect. When he came to their house and while they were eating, he heard a baby crying. That was the moment when he found out that he had a brother. Meanwhile, the disciples had been busy and created their own reports. When Limoto read the reports, he saw that Oriku had done the most because he established the Chikyu sect. This made Ubu proud of Oriku as his mentor. The day had come for Oriku's return to the Spirit Blade sect. While he was on the way, he saw two children playing outside. He approached them and handed over the cape that he was wearing whenever he faced people as the leader of the Chikyu sect. A few hours later, Ofuki was surprised to see someone approaching him. He thought that it was the leader of the Chikyu sect, but it turned out to be the two children. They said that the coat was given to them by a man who also lived there. They just wanted to return it because it looked like expensive. I hope you like it and give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel so you won't miss new uploaded videos. Thank you for watching.